from a public health perspective, there is an approach that I think has been developed and thought about very thoughtfully over the years on, on how to approach um, the idea of reducing uh, injury and death from, from firearms. And, and then I want you to just think there are, there are really three ways to do this um, in terms of broad approaches um, to get this solution of bringing down the incidence of, of um, gun-related uh, injury and death. Uh, and, that, and those are my objectives. They're, they're pretty simple objectives. Um, but that's what I want to leave you with today. Um, and and I, don't, I don't have any conflict of interest other than the fact that I feel very strongly about this topic. Um, but, but I want you to also understand that um, we, we fear um, death from guns. We're all worried about the boogeyman. We're always worried about someone who's going to catch us on the street or, as Dr. Cox said, um, shoot us um, with a firearm, um, some stranger that's going to sneak behind us and do it. But we, we fear this. There's, there's no question about it. But as a society, we also celebrate it. We normalize it through games and through movies. You know, Robocop 2 had lots of deaths, more, you know, less than Robocop 2. Um, Judge Dredd movie, you know, was less violent, although pretty violent. But the new version, Judge Dredd 2, is much more violent, more graphic. Um, and we see it now in all the arcades, you know. Um, sometimes we're shooting aliens, but we've even, even decided that robots can be shot at, you know, humanoid type robots. Um, we, we, we celebrate this stuff. Um, and we just need to think about this from a cultural perspective, for better or for worse, uh, as an issue. They're part of our culture. You know, we have a culture where we hunt and we fish, and that's good. Um, we do sports with firearms, and that's good. But it is absolutely part of our culture. And I think we have to, in any discussion around this, we have to recognize dealing with people where they are and the culture in which we live. And we have this fundamental belief that they can protect us, that somehow having this weapon on us somehow protects us. By the way, that's an interesting behavior that we see in many of our schools, right? Where Kid has a firearm, they bring it to school because somebody else has a firearm. You know, I grew up on, 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 on the old westerns, right? And everybody had to carry a firearm because somebody else carried out a firearm. I mean, you weren't a real man unless you carried a gun, right? So we, we have this view that somehow the firearm protects us uh, in some kind of way. What I'm going to tell you is that Far too often, this is what happens. Person kills himself. Far too often, someone else shoots someone else. And far too often, we have this tragedy where someone kills little kids. And then this real tragedy where a little kid shoots another little kid. I think as we're thinking about this issue, we have to balance all of these perspectives. Um, and we really need to do some reality testing around this issue um, of um, firearm-related injury and death. So let's understand this from a population-based perspective in terms of numbers. This is a true epidemic. 91 Americans are killed with a gun on average each day. If we had a small airplane that crashed each day with 90 people on it, there would be a national outcry. 33,000 people annually. And yet, where is the national outcry? It gets covered in the media when there's a shooting in one of our urban settings. But 91 people on average a day is an epidemic. 
Ask yourself what we did when we had a single Ebola case. Billions of dollars that got thrown into it. Panic in our nations. Updating all our national health care systems. 91 people a day. Where is the outcry? 33,000 people each and every year. And we kill our intimate partners. You know, 51 women a month killed by their partners. That's not the boogeyman. These women know this, their intimate partner. This is not someone who snuck in their room in the middle of the night that they didn't know. This isn't someone who grabbed them on the street that they didn't know. This is someone who knew them. 51 women a month killed by their intimate partners. And our kids are dying at unacceptable rates. Seven kids a day. When my kids were young, I went through great pains to try to protect them. I put those little things in the outlets so they couldn't shock themselves. I, I confess my kid figured out how to pull one of those out and stuck a, a bristle in there one day, but she's OK. I put those little fasteners on the cabinet. And by the way, my kid's pediatrician, even though I'm a physician, spent some time with me talking about how to childproof my home. I got one of those little brochures so I could figure out how to do it as a new parent, how to childproof my home. Now, I got to tell you one thing I didn't do as a, as a parent. I didn't ask whether the places where my kids went to play, whether or not there were firearms there. And I, at that time, didn't have any firearms in my home. But just think about it, seven kids a day. And when you compare these youth deaths to other relatively high-income countries, we are an amazing outlier. We're killing our kids at rates that far exceed other industrialized nations. And you have to ask yourself why that is. And I don't have all the answers for you. In fact, I probably don't have a lot of the answers for you. But these are the numbers. These are the numbers. And that's a big problem. As an African-American male, I have to be concerned about this huge racial disparity in deaths. Now, I want to I remind you, because what often happens is folks say, well, that's black folks killing black folks, OK? And by the way, the white deaths are white folks killing white folks. But if you think that a rate of around 17 per 100,000 for white men is an OK rate to have, even if you don't have that disparity, this is the problem of everybody. This is not a problem that's limited to one ethnic group in our country. Okay? That, that's an important point, because what often happens as a diversion to the discussion, they say, well, that's those inner city folks doing this, so we don't need to worry about it. Okay? No, that's not true. It's an issue throughout lots of parts of our community. And while mass shootings, frankly, are a minority part of the problem, um, <laughs> we're not going too many days without a mass shooting. I define a mass shooting as four or more victims um, uh, at, at a particular event, um, killed or injured. And, and that's a big issue, OK? And those are the ones that get the media and get the press, and the ones in which then we don't do much, um, even though they get all the, all the lights and the, the cameras, et cetera. Um, but it's this persistent drumbeat that ultimately results in the 91 a day, 33,000 a year, uh, that we need for you to remember. I want, to, I want you to get to this number in your head, 91 a day, 33,000 a year. Okay? You need to have that number in your head uh, if we're serious about trying to prevent them. And over 60% of them are suicides. That's not the boogeyman either, with another third being the homicide. Um, and we do pay a lot. I care about the legal interventions um, when police kill folks. 
but it is still a small number of those. Again, getting lots of visibility, an important topic. Um, um, uh, and then a, a small number, what we call technically unintentional. Um, you know, that's me picking up my firearm and the weapon going off for whatever reason, um, and, and me injuring myself or someone else. But you have to ask yourself, you know, why aren't we dealing even at the suicide piece of this? If there's nothing we can do, if I believe we can do something about the homicide piece as well. But even if we didn't touch that piece, what are we doing as clinicians? What is our role to deal with the suicide piece? You know, and you'll hear people tell you that, that, that suicides would have happened anyway. That's the argument. They would have killed themselves anyway. I can assure you as an emergency physician that my clinical ability to help you um, if you sta are stabbed or hit with a brick is a whole lot easier than if you're hit with one of these weapons. Okay? What makes the suicide issue uh, an issue is that suicide is relatively an impulse act. People often rethink that. That's why, remember, we, the intentional cuts they have on their hands, people don't necessarily may not, may not want to do that. Um, they often rethink it. You don't get to rethink it with the gun. You might get to rethink it if you take a pill or cut your wrist, but you don't get to rethink that with the firearm. And far too often, you, you rethink it if you're paralyzed or you're terribly injured because of a failed suicide, and then dealing with all of those issues. So this is the problem, all right? Uh, and you have to ask yourself what we can do about it. But death is the tip of the iceberg. Think about the injury piece of this. You know, like anything else, deaths are always the tip of the iceberg. It's the number of people that are injured is a far bigger uh, piece of this, ar this argument. Uh, almost 200 non-fatal farm injuries every day. A bigger airplane crashing every day, right? Small airplane every day, and then a bigger airplane with twice as many people in it every day. We ground the whole fleet if that happened every day in this country. And yet, we don't do that with these numbers around firearm-related injury. And it's a costly problem. It's a, it's a real costly problem. You want to close the federal deficit? You want to reduce health care costs? I can tell you a lot of what I could do with $229 billion. I could do a nice vacation at $12.8 million a day. I could do a lot of neat stuff for health for $12.8 million a day. And that's one of our big challenges. And we've got lots of guns in our country, more guns than people. <laughs> more guns than people. And the more interesting thing, more guns, more guns in the hands of less people. So more people are having more guns, or less people are having more guns. And of course, every time something happens in this country, they, we go out and buy even more guns. I mean, when I was growing up, I used to thought it was cool when you had the, the six-shooter on your hip, or I watched the, the, the law enforcement movies where the folks had the, the extra gun in behind them or under their ankle. You know, we used to think that was cool because they had two guns. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying folks shouldn't have their, their weapons, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm saying that we need to think about what this all means in a society. We want, you know, what's causes injury and death uh, in our country. We have a Second Amendment. The Heller case, which was argued in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Uh, um, had a rule about having um, guns in your home. Um, uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, in Heller that the Second Amendment was an individual right to have a firearm in your home. I'll let the lawyers correct me if I, I mistake that. But I, I want to point out that, like everything else, they didn't point out the second part. And by the way, you know, this is written, I believe, by Scalia, the late, great Justice Scalia. Um, and I, as a public health practitioner, emphasize his second point, much less than I do his first point. But I honor his first point. And the fact that certain gun laws are still valid. 
you know, limit the fact that there probably are some weapons that we ought not be able to, to have um, for a variety of reasons, recognizing that technological changes occur all the time. You know, a musket is very different than the automatic weapons we have today, which is very different than an Uzi. All right? And that was recognized by the court in making that argument. They didn't say what those boundaries were completely, but they did say they were boundaries. And we need to recognize that those boundaries exist because the first point gets made four or five times each and every day, and that second bullet doesn't get emphasized often enough. Now, I told you that, that we think guns are protective. Today, we have some data, and that data suggests, not only in the United States, but in other countries, uh, that the protective safety of firearms is overestimated, meaning that good data that shows that the risk of being killed uh, if you have a gun in your home, it's three times more likely. And in public health, we talk about risks. Um, and a suicide is five times more likely. All right? And by the way, the person that's more likely to risk to shoot you is somebody that knows you. It's not often the boogeyman. Even, off, by the way, in, in gang-related stuff. So this is, this is a big issue, and even trained law enforcement often have issues around firearms. So as we talk about a public health approach, well, we look at defining the problem, identifying risks, developing strategies, and then trying to assume widespread adoption. We like to use the automobile um, uh, crashes as an example. We made cars safer. We made people safer in their cars, and we made the environment safer for cars and people using a multidisciplinary, multi-sector approach to firearms. And the result was, unlike firearm-related deaths, we dramatically have reduced more vehicle deaths in our country. We know how to do this through that approach. So how do we do this? Um, by making guns safer, people safer with their guns, and the environment safer um, for people and guns in a, the same environment. Uh, and let me go back to the, the cars for a moment. So you think about it, um, we added seat belts and airbags, and you know, there many, in the earlier cars, that engine, if you had a front end collision, used to come into the passenger compartment. That doesn't happen anymore, okay? We redesigned cars. We did all kinds of things to, to make sure that uh, deep, you know, driving while intoxicated is, is, um, is reduced. Um, we've done things to do driver safety. We do graduated safety training with our kids. All these things to make people safer with cars. Uh, and then we uh, made the environment safer so cars just don't slide off the road and we put guardrails up. All those things were done to try to make, um, to bring down automobile collisions and death and injury in cars. So things we can do, obviously, to make guns safer is using some technology, you know? Using some technology. The way you get into this device, certainly with a password or fingerprint. There are guns out there that are being designed that can do that, OK? So that someone else can't take my firearm from me and use it against me. Those of us who love you know, the, the movies Call it the old James Bond gun. Trigger locks that are integrated in the, in the firearm. Something that tells you that the gun is loaded. Wouldn't it be nice to have a blinking light to let you know the gun is loaded? Or something to let you know that's the case. And things that reduce the lethality of guns. OK? Guns are getting a lot more lethal than they, than they were and needed to be um, probably in civilian hands. That, that's a bait, probably a debate for later. Making people safer with their guns, licensing people, making people take firearm safety classes, physician counseling, um, locking your firearms separately from your, your ammunition. All those things are important um, as part of making people safer with their guns. Making the environment safer, background checks, universal background checks, getting rid of the loophole on the background checks, reducing the number of guns. 
um, particularly that people can buy at any one point in time so that people can't put those in the black market. Dealing with bad Apple gun dealers, those are the dealers that know they're selling guns um, illegally or selling guns that might end up in the black market. Whole range of things um, around sensible gun laws that can actually make the environment safer for those of us with our firearms. And then dealing with this idea of a robust research enterprise, I know you're going to have some speakers that talk about uh, this later, but um, several years ago, uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention was literally prohibited from um, as intervening uh, or supporting research that could be used for advocacy. Um, it's not an absolute prohibition, uh, but the language has chilled research. Um, and it's a real problem. And so um, as we think about this idea of trying to make firearms safer, um, people safer with their firearms, and the environment safer for people and firearms to be in the same space, um, we have a lot to do. Um, and I would just encourage you as, you, as you think about this, again, to go back and adopt what I said um, as I opened up my presentation. Um, because you will be asked, why do doctors care about this? And I'd love for you all to say, it's mine because it hurts people or it kills people. It's a physician's prerogative. And I thank you very much.